How can you help someone that is in a relationship that will cause them to miss heaven? How could you help someone that is in a relationship that will cause them to miss heaven? Let me see. I want to give you a Bible verse for this. I know what my rationale says, but I'm trying to think of verse that corresponds with it. As a matter of fact, I got one. Turn from your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. It's odd. Because as I was praying about things that distract us, that take place throughout the day, my mind was on someone that I knew before, and I was actually just now praying for them. And I was praying about a situation that happened with them. And I was saying, man, Lord, how much you wanted to do for this individual. You know, it's amazing that you could see, you could look, you know, you're from the outside looking in. You could see what God wants to do for certain people. But sometimes they don't see it themselves. And this is actually what I'm just praying. Lord, what you wanted to do. And then my mind said, well, you can lead a person to a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, I don't care what you do. God has given us the freedom of choice unless a man or woman chooses to go in the direction that you feel that they should go in. No change will come in their lives. So can I say something? Can I act a certain way? Can I do something? Yes. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, sorry, and verse 16. The Bible says this. Let your light do what? Let your light so shine before men... That they may see your good works and do what? So the Bible says, don't just let your light shine, but let it so shine. Let it shine in such a particular way that as men and women behold your actions, what you do, what you say, the end result is they will give glory to God. Let's go to one more verse, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. Because when it says, let your light so shine, you know, it, brothers and sisters, we cannot, I, I say it all the time because I'm, I'm really learning this. This is new for me, you know. This is something that I've learned in the past few years, you know. I can't go to people. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, especially if someone in a relationship that's wrong, you know, they know that the, the relationship's wrong. You know, I know this person ain't for me, but I'm in it. Sometimes, ladies, we settle. You know, that brother ain't no good. He ain't, he ain't a, he's no good. He doesn't treat you right. And we settle as if, hey, this is the best that I could get. Well, then you're playing yourself cheap. You're playing yourself cheap. And so that man or that woman probably knows, you know what? This one ain't the one for me, but hey, it's the best that I could get. We could settle on a car. You know, we could settle with a car. You know, but don't settle on a relationship. Why? Because a person has the ability to either draw you closer to Christ, closer to Christ or bring you further out into the world. The person has the ability, you know, we, this is why dating is so serious. You look in the Bible and guess what? You show me one time you see somebody, a Christian, a man or woman that surrendered their heart to Christ, dating. You show me that any time in the Bible. You've never seen it. What do you see? You see a principle that's called courting. Now we're in Proverbs chapter 4. You see a principle that's called courting. And what courting is, is God has given you the permission. God has showed you that this is to be your husband or your wife. Therefore, he has allowed you the, the privilege of now coming together. Preparatory to marriage. See, dating, you know why we have so many divorces in this day and age? 
because of dating. I like you, you like me, you look good, I look good, let's get together. And then what happens when the personality doesn't match the looks? I'm cool. I'm done with you. Let me find someone else. So, okay, now you look good, and you say you, you're doing the same scenario all over again. And you're looking, and you find it, and you're hunting, and you are experiencing failure after failure after failure. Until one time, either you get it right, or you get to about 35, 40, 50 years old, and you say, I better get married so I have somebody. And you marry the next person that comes along. You got a terrible marriage. But you're in it now. And so what does God say? He says, if you court, if you let me choose that mate for you, I will give you the one that I have ordained for you. God has never intended for us to experience failures. And so what people do is they take that experience, that dating experience, and they bring it into their marriage life. And that's why we have people having, okay, you know, this marriage don't work, okay, let's get a divorce. And I'll marry again. And, oh, hey, this ain't working, and let's get a divorce. And we marry again. Because that's how we have begun with dating. But when we allow God to choose our mate for us, that when you know that for sure, see, when I know for certain clear evidence that the young lady back there in the back on the camera, God chose her to be my wife, then guess what? Come what may, I'm willing to press. I'm willing to work with it. I'm willing to sacrifice because I know God chose her for me. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth what? More and more unto the perfect day. So when the Bible says let your light so shine, God is talking about not just let it shine, but let it continue to grow. Let your experience with Christ continue to grow so that people will look at you and say, hey, there's a difference. And I want to know the God that you serve. That's the only thing I know you can do. Live for Jesus and let somebody's heart be tender because they watch you. Now we're gonna we're going to uh, finish up from last night. So we're gonna do a little bit of recap. We're gonna do go back over it just a little bit to try to bring some of you who weren't here up to speed to what we were talking about. And then we're gonna finish with three different points. One, we were talking about the chaff. We didn't get there yet, but the chaff, the stone. And the mountain. We want to look at these three symbols in the Word of God and see exactly what they mean. So turn from your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, once again. The book of Daniel, chapter 2. You want to keep your finger in Daniel, chapter 2. Put a piece of paper there. Because we're going to be coming back to it because here is where all the symbols are presented in the book of Daniel chapter 2. And what was one of the principles that we are looking at that God uses when he deals with prophecy? That God uses symbolic language to describe something literal. God used a horse. He uses, in this scenario, he uses an image. So the first thing we saw is, there we go, that the head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon. And the kingdom of Babylon came on the scene in 606 B.C. Or rather, no, it ruled the world from 606 B.C. to 538 B.C. Babylon was, now one of the characteristics of all of these nations, who remembers one of the characteristics of every last nation that is being named? What is it? They are world rulers. So the Bible is getting ready to show us all of the nations that have ever ruled the entire world. The Bible is going to show us this right now. There have only been 
four nations thus far that have had sole rule over the world. The second nation, the next nation that took over from Babylon, we said it in our quiz, was represented by the breast and arms of silver, and that was the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The joint, the joint rulership of the Medes and the Persians. Who are the Persians today? Iranians. The Iranians. Who were the Babylonians? They were the Iraqis. The third kingdom is the belly and thighs of brass. And it is Greece. And it came on the scene in 331 B.C. It left the scene in 168 B.C. A final kingdom. We looked and we said that this kingdom, this kingdom of iron represented Rome and every time you find Rome each and every prophecy remember this is the foundational prophecy and I'm just trying to move quickly to bring us up to speed so we could press forward every single prophecy in time event we will see either an enlargement or a repeating of these nations so the kingdom of Rome, as we study the other prophecies, the kingdom of Rome, always you have to search and dig. You have to compare scripture. The Bible never explains it, just lays it out. Then we went to um, the feet of iron and clay. Now, we're going to, I want to write this one here. I think I want to start here. We're going to go very briefly over this, but we're going to look at this, these points one more time. The feet of iron and clay. We looked in our quiz and we saw that the clay represents God's people. Now some of you said false when he said does it represent God's people. So did the quiz man try to trick us in that one? I think he did. Because, because it's, it, 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 if you, it is God's people. So I'm going to give you credit. If you said false, I'm going to ride with you. Because it's true and false. Why so? There's two types of clay there, remember? Let's look here. Let's look at here. Let's look at here. Well, okay, the iron, what he was asking was what does the clay represent? And yes, it's true, it is God's people, but it's God's people in two different conditions. Let's look here. Let's look here. Let's see this. First of all, we went to the verse in Jeremiah chapter 18. And verse 6, where, where Jeremiah says, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, as the potter does with the clay? As the, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So the clay, house of Israel, we just made it simple and said God's people, okay? The clay represented God's people. Now we see the clay and the iron. The iron never changed. So the iron was Rome. The clay represented God's people. But here in verse 41, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41 it says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be, what brothers and sisters? Divided. So when it's potter's clay, potter's clay, the Bible says, the clay is in the hand of the potter. Potter's, his clay. Clay that is able to be molded and shaped as the potter, which is God, sees fit. Then there's another type of clay. It says, there's a change that comes about, it says, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron, what? Mixed. So when it said potter's clay, what was the kingdom like? Divided. It was divided. Did you see that? When it said miry clay, what was the kingdom like? It was mixed. It was mixed. Are we together? Okay. we just repeating something. We're just repeating. And so we said that the miry clay was the people of God in sin or in Go with me your Bibles to the book of Second Peter. Let me show you that with one verse. 
We won't go to all the different verses that we went to last night. Just one verse. Second Peter chapter 2. It's so terrible, you know, that, 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 that we have that in this day and age. Because you know something? I want to say this again. I said it before. The problem with sin and sinners is not a world's problem. The, you know, when you know, we say the people of the world, you know, we, we name all of these bad people, you know, stealers and, you know, all this other stuff. It's not their problem. The problem with sin is with the church. The, 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 the best agent for Satan is the unconverted Christian. The best agent is the unconverted Christian. Why? I once read that they are false signs pointing in the wrong direction. They're saying, I'm a Christian. Well, what are you telling me? That if you live like me, you will have a relationship with Christ. But wait a minute. Didn't I see you sneaking out of so-and-so's house at X o'clock in the morning? But you say you're a Christian. Well, God forgives. Well, sure. But what are you teaching me? That one day I could be on fire for the Lord. Next day I could be lukewarm and God will accept me anyways. A bad example. And so we discredit, we discredit Christianity when we claim Christianity and we don't live for God. So the world's not the problem. You know, we know, you know, the world knows how to perfect sin. You know, we never had a problem living in sin. It's living for Christ. So the Bible says here in Second Peter chapter uh, um, 2, verse 21. It says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So better for them to live for God than to turn away from God. Verse 22. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that is washed to her wallowing where? In the mire. Or in, it says, it likens the mire to sin. If you leave God, you go backslide, you're in apostasy, you're living in sin. So God's people in apostasy represents the miry clay. Then this is the point that we want to look at. What happens during the time frame of these ten toes? Now, what we're going to skip over tonight, and I told you that last night, is we're going to skip over the fact that these ten toes, once I show you the end result, we're going to come back and we're going to start looking at this feet indefinite. We're going to start looking at that clearly because we're living, I hear people say, you know, we're living in the, in the toenails of the toes and we're living in the fungus of the toenails of the toes. We're living in the last days, you know, at the very end of time. And they use this prophecy to show that because the prophecy stopped in what? 476 A.D. When Rome was divided, Rome was conquered, and it was divided into ten different nations. That's why it was ten toes. It was divided into ten different nations. But listen to what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2. And that's why I said the ten toes represent the ten kings. But we're going to come back to that, brothers and sisters. We're going to come back to that, uh, uh, not tomorrow night, which is no meeting, probably Saturday night. And keep in mind, we're just going to move the meetings down because we're going to finish all of these different prophecies. I want you to see where we're at in our day and age. So we're going to just move all the nights down and we're going to finish them as we can. Is that alright? The Bible says... In verse, uh, um, in verse 44, and here's where we want to go. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom shall, which, shall, um, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever for as much as thou starst the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands. And then it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. So now, we want to look at 
a couple of things. The Bible says that at this time frame, after the division of Rome, that the stone is going to hit this image, destroy the image, and God is going to set up a kingdom. So we want to look at this stone, which was cut out of the mountain, but then what happens to the image? Go back with me in your Bibles, and here we could, we could go to this picture here, here we see the stone getting ready to smash the image. Go to verse, uh, um, verse 34. The Bible says in verse 34, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and it became like what? The chaff. So God gives us a time frame of what's getting ready to happen. He says that the stone or the image is broken to pieces, how? Together. And it becomes as chaff. Now remember what these elements represent. These elements represent each one of the nations. I'm going to ask you a question. And we're not going to answer it yet. Each one of these nations had a different time frame. It had from 606 to 538. From 538 to 331. From 331 to 168. From 168 to 476. How could they be destroyed together? How could they all be destroyed together if these nations were no longer in existence or they were no longer in power? Well, first, let's see the time frame of the chaff. Go from your Bibles to the book of Psalms, the first division of Psalms. As we Now we, we, we hope that you're up to date. You didn't get all of the information from last night, but you got enough so you know where we're at. Psalms 1, the Bible says in verse 4. Psalms 1 and verse 4. What does the chaff represent? The Bible says in Psalms 1, and verse 4, it tells us what the chaff represents. The Bible says, The ungodly are not so, but are driven like the what? Yeah. Like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not do what? Stand where? So, so the, the chaff represents the wicked and the Bible says that they will be driven by the wind and then it says that they will not stand when in the judgment God is giving us a time frame the chaff become chaff during the judgment now wait a minute well what do you mean by that once talk with a farmer and why he says the wind drives them away. He says, because what they would do, you ever see the people that are, it's, uh, uh, they're ca it's called winnowing. And they're tossing the wheat up in the air. And a lot of people, because, you know, maybe not a lot of people, what I used to think that what they're doing is they're tossing it up in the air so that the things that are unwanted would fall down beneath. Not so. Not so. They're tossing it up in the air and they're sitting in a breeze. So that as they toss the, 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 the wheat in the air, that the wind would catch the chaff, which is lighter than the wheat, and it would blow it away. It would drive it away. There was a separation between that which was good and that which was useless. You get it? Go to the book of Matthew now. Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3.
What will they do with the chaff? Because this is speaking of the judgment time. This is speaking of a separation. Remember God has spoken of the wheat and the tares. He says, let them grow until the harvest. Let them grow together until the harvest. And then he will make a separation. The Bible says this in verse 12. It says, whose fan, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will do what? Burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we're talking about the judgment. The chaff represents the wicked that won't stand in the judgment, but God says that judgment time, the wicked or the chaff will burn. Now if you were here the other night, you should understand where we're going. And you should see that God is taking us down, not simply to his second coming, but to the end of sin, when he eradicates sin from the earth. How do we know that? Go from your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 17. Let's look at this, this chaff a little bit more. The book of Isaiah, chapter 17. Isaiah chapter 17, and I want us to look at verse 13. No, in verse 12. When will God blow this wind, which represents the separation between the wheat and the chaff? When will he do this? When the nations do something. They're going to do something that will cause God to make this separation and to do what? To burn them. Now, I keep saying them, right? We're not going to place ourselves there. Amen. I mean, let's make a choice, brothers and sisters. Let's be decided in our mind. The Bible says in verse 12, it says, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Then it says, The nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them, and they shall flee far off and be chased as the what? chaff of the mountain before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. So God says when the nations are rushing then God is going to blow the wind and the wind will separate the chaff. Well what does it mean that the nations are rushing? What are they rushing to do? Go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 47. Jeremiah 47. I want you to see this time frame because I told you before, you know, some people teach that, that man is this stone and that man is going to destroy the nations. Some people teach that and, and, it's, and it doesn't sound like it's a bad thing right now, but as you see who the stone represents, and if you see what takes place to the chaff, you'll see that man could not possibly be that. And they want to give this example because there's another verse, and that verse says that it, it, it teaches of a man who goes into the sanctuary, and all of those who aren't living for God, he has a slaughter weapon on his hand, and the, and the, and the Bible tells him to go and slay everybody. And they teach that there's going to come a time where God is going to tell the Christian to go into the church and all those who are fake Christians, kill them. I'm, hey, I know you never, you probably never heard of a lot of stuff. But I'm just saying, there's some stuff out there. There's some, there's some wild teachings out of there and it's a large group. I'm not going to name the denomination. I'm not going to name them. But it's a large group that teach that. I told you the other night, there's nothing worse than a religious zealot. Nothing worse than, than somebody who says, I have to do it because I know God told me to do it. So therefore, I'm going to do it. And I mean, you, 
Look, look what's happening in, 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 in Iraq and these other foreign countries right now. Now you could say what you want to say about the people. I'm not trying to lift them up or put them down. You say what you want to say about them. But why you're able to get so many people that are able to strap bombs to their bodies because they believe that God wants them to do it. Therefore, I'm not concerned with my well-being and I don't even care about the innocent child that may be hurt as well. I'm following the directions of God. What would happen if those who really believed in God, not in Allah, but those that really believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior said, listen, whatever God tells me to do, I will do. And how do you know God is directing you? Because God is never directing you to fix somebody else's problem. That's when you know Satan's leading you. For the Spirit convinces us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Your sins, not somebody else's. When you see somebody else's sins... It's because God wants you to pray for them. Righteousness, Christ's righteousness and judgment make a choice. God's not pointing out other people's sins. He's not putting you here to fix somebody else. If they would act right, my life would be good. Not so. There'd be somebody else to come along to do the same thing that they was doing, if not worse. But learn like Paul says, I have learned that whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. That means I don't care what you do. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. Last point on that right there. I love the saying that says, stress is not what someone does to you. It's how you respond to what someone does to you. Somebody come in here and step on my shoes. Hey, don't worry about it. I just polished them. It's okay. I polish them again. Somebody else? Man, you stepped on my shoes. Man, are you crazy? Now you want to fight. Same action, different response. So the Bible says that when the nations are rushing, then the wind will come. Then this separation will take place. Well, what are they rushing to do? Jeremiah chapter 47, the Bible says in verse 3... It says, at the noise of the stamping of the hooves of his strong horses, at the rushing of his what? Chariots, and at the rumblings of his wheels, the fathers shall not look back to their children for feebleness of hand. This is speaking of war getting ready to take place. So they're rushing to war. When the nations are rushing to war... God says he's going to burn them and pour out judgment. They're wicked. Wait a minute. Together, right? Together. All of the nations together. Where do we see in the Bible? Look, I just saw a light go off. Rum brother just said, oh, I got it. Where do we see in the Bible all of the nations coming together, rushing to do war? Or to do battle. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 20. The subject that we looked at the other night. The book of Revelation chapter 20. The book of Revelation chapter 20. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9. It says, first let's go to verse 8. It says, speaking of Satan, and he shall go out to deceive the nations, plural, which are in the four quarters of the earth. And the four quarters represents the east, the north, the south, and the west. That means everybody. Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city and fire came down out of heaven and did what? And burned them. It's speaking of the judgment day at the end of time. This took us all the way to when Christ erases sin. We learned the other night, brothers and sisters. If you weren't here, you need to ask somebody. We learned that man is not burning in hell fire right now. 
Hellfire is not burning right now. The Bible says that when the saints, or when the saints, when the city comes down and the saints get in the city, that the wicked will surround the new Jerusalem and fire come down out of heaven and burn them. Listen to what this says. Here we're in this verse. Listen, listen to what it says here in verse 14. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the what? Second death, verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and every man, uh, and, and they were judged every man according to their works. If hell is some burning place, then how could hell be cast into the lake of fire? Hell, brothers and sisters, is a Greek word or a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word means Sheol, which means grave, and the Greek word means Hades, where we get the word Hades from, which simply means the grave. That's why Christ was able. That's why the Bible says Christ, he says, he says, I will not suffer my Holy One to, uh, to be corrupted or to remain in hell or the grave. How could you throw the fire into the fire? Hell fire is not burning right now. And so, and so what we have is God's taking us down to the time where all of the nations, these are the four world rulers. Now we're going to look a lot closer. Again, just bear with me. We're going to look a lot closer at the feet and toes of iron and clay. What was one point that we brought out? The toes, the feet of iron and clay. God's people mingling with Rome. The merger of church and state who is this stone what is this stone that is going to hit this image on its feet turn from your bibles to the book of acts actually let's go to this one first go to first corinthians let's go to first corinthians chapter 10 let's look at a few verses here first corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you what I used to do. You know what? I never used to know how to give Bible studies. I never used to know how to give Bible studies. And what I used to do, because, you know, I used to simply read the Bible. I would simply read. Come on, pay attention. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I would simply read the Bible. And as I was read, I never was trying to prepare a study. I was never trying to prepare anything. And, and people would ask me questions. I said, okay, well, let's just see. And God would bring verses back to my mind. John chapter 14. I want you to claim this promise. Write this down on your paper. John chapter 14 and verse 26. The Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. God will teach us and remind us when the time is right. That's his promise. But he can't bring anything back to our remembrance if by the power of the Holy Spirit we have not allowed him to put it there first. We got to study, brothers and sisters. I don't care what your life's like. I don't, care, I don't care what you are doing. We sitting here talking about, you know, you know, you know I, I remember talking to a young man the other day. He was he, 16 years old. Talking to him the other day. And he says, you know, I, I, I just don't want to serve God right now. I said, I can accept that. He says, I don't want to, I don't want to serve God. You know, I, I don't want to live for Christ. He says, I want to have fun. I said, I can accept that. He said, you know, he says, because so many times I've given my heart to God and I've backslidden. He says, when I get older, I'm going to give my heart to Christ because I've always come back to Christ. Ain't that the lie of the devil? I've always come back to Christ. Well, if you've come back to Christ, why would you have left him? Come on now. Let's just be real. If I've already given my heart completely and totally to Christ, why would I have ever left him? 
They said, that means I left Christ. Christ, you was, you was cool. You was all right. But I just, I just love, I just love going to the club, getting so drunk that I find myself hugging the toilet, throwing up. Now that's fun. That's fun. Ladies, I love going to the club and my friend leaves me and a couple of men pick me up and the next thing I know I'm getting gang raped. That's fun. I left Christ because I wanted to have fun. Oh, I love hanging out with the fellas and the homies and, and, and I'm taking up for the little homie. Because he don't talk good enough and, and, and I don't think he's strong enough, but he leaves me when they see all them dudes coming up. And they black my eye and put some knots on my head. That's fun. That's what I left Christ for. Come on now. Come on. Not so. You're right. It's not. And, 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 and so if I left Christ. Okay, okay. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. We're, gonna, we're getting ready to wrap this up. We're going to hit two more points. We're going to hit two more points. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you. And so we ask for your spirit to be in this place. Keep us, protect us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So now, this stone, we're here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says in verse 4, and all drink the, the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was who? Christ. So the stone, I say, was Christ. Now the Bible says the rock. Now some say that we're the stone, but I say it's Christ. It says here that the rock is Christ, but let's look a little more closer because although it says the rock, let's see if the Bible says that the stone is Christ as well. Go for your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 4. You know, I, remember I told you, you can't take one verse, and this is what these people do. They take one verse because the Bible says that we are lively stones. Only one time you see that, and, and then we'll take one verse, and we'll try to build the doctrine off of that one verse. But all through the Bible, Christ is called the stone. What does it say in the book of Acts chapter 4? Acts chapter 4, verse 11. The book of Acts chapter 4, verse 11, it says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. What do you mean? What name are you talking about? Look at verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that, that by the name of Jesus Christ... This stone that was rejected and is being rejected today is none other than Jesus Christ. Christ is going to destroy. If we have linked ourselves with Christ, then we simply will not be destroyed, brothers and sisters. We will come with Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Jude, verse 14, it says that, 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 that the saints... It says that Christ will come with thousands of saints to execute judgment... That means when the nations have the judgment executed upon them. And what is the execution of judgment? The fire, which has been reserved unto the day of judgment. We'll come with him, but Christ will be doing the work. Let's go to another first. Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Let's go to one more verse. The book of Matthew chapter 21. He speaks of this rock here again in verse 42. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. The Bible says, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scripture, The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever, get this, shall fall on this stone, shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will do what? 
Grind them to powder. You know what that means? Grind them to powder? I looked at I looked at the original language. Now look at two things. Listen to what happens. It says whoever the stone falls upon, it'll grind them to powder, right? What's going to happen to the image? It's going to be ground to powder, the Bible says, and it becomes like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. That word in the original language means to winnow. When it says it's going to grind them to powder, that means to winnow, to separate the wheat from the chaff. The Bible says fall on Christ and be broken. What does it mean to be broken? It means to be surrendered. It means to surrender. Christ says, this is my body which was broken for you. Christ gave us all. And he says, fall on me. I'll teach you how to give your all. You don't know how to do it. You don't know how. But if you come to me, if you fall on me, I'll show you how to give your life to me. But if you don't, God forbid, you're going to be part of that image. It's going to get ground to powder. He says, Christ says, Christ says in the book of Ezekiel, He says, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. Therefore, turn yourselves and live. Then he asked the question, why would you die? Why would you die? Turn yourself and live. And then this mountain, we're about to close. So this stone represents Jesus Christ. The chaff represents the wicked And the only time you have chaff is at the end of the harvest. The judgment, brothers and sisters. Speaking of the end of the world, when God is going to remove sin and sinners from this earth. What does the mountain represent? As we are about to close, what does this mountain represent? Go for your Bibles now. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says, number one, we see the stone, and, and also the Bible says the stone was cut out without what? Without hands. Praise God, you saw that. That represents the fact that Christ was not created. Why do you say that? Because Micah chapter 5 and verse 13 says that, 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 uh, that they are not to worship these graven images. Which are the works of thine hand. The Bible also tells us, and I can't remember the verse right now. But it says that, 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 that we are thy creation or we are all the works of thine hand. We are God's creation. So what you do with your hand shows that you create or you make something. Christ was cut out without hands. So I don't care what denomination. Christ was never created. Christ was always and always will be. The Bible calls him, in the book of Revelation, Alpha and Omega. And some people say, well, that's God the Father. No, that's speaking of Jesus Christ. Here, let me show you that. Let's just, let me just show you that one right there. Go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Let me show you this. That this is this, the Alpha and Omega. The, he who has no beginning and has no ending is Jesus Christ. Our Savior. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 1. I want you to see this. I want you to see this for yourselves. When someone tells you that Christ was created. He's a created being. I want you to show them this verse. Say no brother. You got it wrong. Christ is our Savior. He died for us. He made the choice to come here. He didn't have to. The Bible says in the book of Revelation Chapter 1, listen to what it says. It says, uh, um, it says in verse 4, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you. And he goes to salute the churches with flowery language. But look at verse 4. He says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. And then he says in verse 7, behold, he cometh with what? With clouds. Look at verse 8. I am who? Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and saith the Lord, which, wa- which is, which was, and which is to come. Now listen to this. When was Christ when he is? 
that was represented when he was in heaven. When he was his death on the cross, he is to come, his second coming. Satan imitates that. We'll see that maybe later on. But this is, now let's go to another verse. Let's go to another verse. There's more in here. Or this whole first chapter is a symbol of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, which is, which was, and which is to come. Look here at verse, uh, verse 18. I'm going to just show you that what I said. It's in verse 18. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, what? I am alive forevermore, which is, which was, and is to come. I, was de- I, I am alive. I was dead. And I'm alive forevermore. Go to one more verse. Revelation. Let's go here to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, verse 12. Verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. What, do you have a colored Bible? What letter are those words in your Bible? They're red. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Then he says what in verse, uh, uh, verse 13? I am who? Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end, the first and the last. And then he says in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel. Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. Beginning, no ending. He was not created. Therefore, he was cut out of this mountain without hands. What is the mountain? Go to, go, go, go to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 2. See, listen, brothers and sisters, when we study our Bibles, you know, we don't run when the, you know, when the people come to your house and they want to, you know, listen, when the Mormons come to my house and a Jehovah Witness come to my house and whatever denomination come knocking on your doors wanting to give Bible studies, I don't hide from them. Oh, man, man. Man, are they gone yet? I don't hide from them. I don't. I open the door. Say, hey, come on in. I know it's hot out there. You want some water? Come on in. Teach me something. Sit down. Because when we study, when we read, when we read and we study, then we know we're for sure. And then we want to help. When the, brothers, when, the, when the young brothers come up to me when they had their white shirts on and their pins, I invite them in. Sit down because these, listen, they're some soldiers. You know what? You can't knock the Jehovah Witness. You can't, you can't knock them because they're soldiers. Because I don't care if you disagree with what they teach. They're preaching it. They're out there in the community and they're meeting the people where they are. And they're giving them what they believe to be the gospel. And if we say we're Christians, and if we don't like the Jehovah's Witness, or if we don't like the Mormons, or we don't like whoever, then why aren't you giving the gospel? Why aren't you visiting the home? Why aren't you giving love to the neighbor? Does your next door neighbor know that you're a Christian? Does your next door neighbor, have you even asked them, Will you have a Bible study? You want to study the Bible? What you doing today? Let's just study the Bible. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. Tell people about Jesus if he abides in your heart. Let's go on. Let's go on. Where are we at? We're in Isaiah chapter 2. We're going to do this mountain and then we're going to get out of here tonight, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 2, it says, And it shall come to pass, verse 2, it shall come to pass in what days? In the last days, that the mountain of what? Of the Lord's house shall be established where? In the top of the mountains. So the mountain of the what? So the mountain here is referenced to as being the Lord's house. What is the Lord's house? Okay, you, you're good. That's, that's exactly what it is. But let's see the Bible say that. Amen? First Timothy chapter 3. The Bible is going to say that. 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's exactly what it is. It is the church. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
The Bible says in verse 15, the Lord's house represents the church. Christ is cut out of the mountain, but then it says that the stone becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. So this Bible here says in verse 15, it says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how, lo- how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the what? The church of the living God. So the house of God, the mountain, represents The church. Christ was cut out of the church. To establish. He was cut out of the mountain. To establish a mountain. Doesn't make sense. He was cut out of the church. To establish a church. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Oh someone said yes it does. Okay all right, amen. Well let's look a little closer. Let's look a little closer. Go from your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 66 now. Isaiah chapter 66. Let's give a little bit more definition. The book of Isaiah chapter 66. Let me get there. We want to look at verse verse 20. Verse 20. Isaiah Chapter 66 and verse 20, the Bible says, And they shall bring all their all your and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in leaders and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain what? To my holy mountain Jerusalem. So the mountain The mountain is not simply the church, but the Bible says it also is Jerusalem. Now, Christ is coming to set up a new what? Let me show you this. Go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you why. And then we're going to see where Christ, well, just go to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. We're about to close, brothers and sisters. Are you anxious? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. It says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable company of angels. So this is the new Jerusalem or the heavenly Jerusalem that Christ is getting ready to set up. But he was cut out of this church to set up another church here on earth. Let's see one more verse. Go to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. I want you to get this thought here. Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says in verse 2. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a what? A bride adorned for a husband. So New Jerusalem is a what? Then who's the husband? Jesus. Jesus is getting ready to get a bride, right? The bride represents the people, the territory, as well as the city. The people, the territory, as well as the city. But New Jerusalem is referenced as a bride. That's why the Bible calls it the marriage feast or the marriage of the Lamb, right? So what happens at a wedding? What happens when a young man finds this woman that he's going to marry and he brings her home and he shows her to the family? He living at home. What happens when it's time to get married? What must he do? They're joined together, but they got to do something else. Go to the book of Genesis. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 2. 
Go to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Come on now. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. The book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One flesh. That means when we get married, it's no longer acceptable to keep running home and say, Mom, could you help us out? It's time men to, hey, this is what I got to do. Can't keep coming home. Asking the parents to take care of us. Now, parents, you know, we, go, we can help. It's all right. It's all right to give assistance and help. But, uh, you know, keep the family, keep, the, keep your mother and keep your father out of your business. Keep them out of your business. Your wife is number one now. Your husband is number one. And yes, Dad, I, you know, I, I know you raised me this way, but, but listen, my husband said, and my wife likes it this way, therefore that's how it's going to be. Because this is my home now. Now, we know that Christ, the Father, the, is, is the Father. Oh, sorry, sorry. We know that, 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 that God is the Father. But then who's the mother? Some people say that the Holy Spirit is a mother. You ever heard that? Is a woman. That's why they say Christ was created. Because the Holy Spirit was a woman. And God was a father. And the two got together and then they had Jesus Christ. Not so. Let's see who the mother. What was the mountain? The mountain was also what? Go off me your Bibles. We're going to go to two more verses and we're going to close. Go off me your Bibles to the book of Galatians. Chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Who's the mother? The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 4 beginning in verse 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free which is the what? Mother of us all. Christ had to leave. Do you remember what he said? Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Christ left. Christ left. He left the old system of worship. He left, he, he left behind the, you don't have to slay lambs. Some people say that the Jews are now, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, we're spending all this money to protect the Jews. They're not God's chosen people. Those that accept Christ are. Those that accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior are the chosen ones. Whether He says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither free nor bond. Nothing special about the Jews any more special than you and I. And Christ left. And now he's getting ready to set up a new uh, 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 kingdom here on earth. Well, sin will be no more. Where sin will be no more. And our final verse, Numbers chapter 14. Because this mountain fills the whole earth. And I want to turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 14. Our final verse. Numbers chapter 14. The Bible says in verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with what? This mountain that fills the whole earth, brothers and sisters, glory represents God's character. Glory represents his character. The Bible says that the earth will be filled with the character of God, or rather, people who represent Christ's character. What a wonderful thought. That soon, brothers and sisters, 
Jesus Christ will erase the stain of sin. Soon, child molestation will be something that we would be easy to forget. Soon murder will be erased from our mouth. Diabetes will be no more. Wearing glasses, back pains. Some people looking around, oh, you wait. Soon it'll be no more. Soon it'll be erased. But even more important, soon we will say thank you for what Jesus Christ has done for us face to face. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, tonight we want to be. Tonight we accept freedom. Tonight we give you our all. Tonight we plead for your spirit to reveal to us what it means to exercise our faith. Pour out your spirit in this room, Lord. May we leave tonight free. The baggage and the luggage that we came in with. May we cast our cares at, our, at your feet. For the Bible says you care for us. May we not leave burdened and troubled on what the future holds. But may we leave relieved and at peace. Because Christ holds us. And tonight the opportunity is available. Tonight Jesus Christ wants to be your Savior. He already died and paid the price. But what that means simply is. He wants you to accept salvation. So regardless of what your life, the question is tonight, will you allow Christ to be your Savior? If the question is yes, I simply want you to raise your hand. Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to free me from myself, from my choices. I want to give you my all. Is there another? God sees your hands. You can put them down. Is there another? Is there another? Can you leave at peace? Do you dare leave? Not knowing that you're surrendered? Don't let the devil trick you. You can't give your all now. Look what you got planned. You can't surrender now. You have to do this first. You have to do that first. You have to give up this. Well, guess what? If you give those things up first, then you don't need Christ. Christ says, I want to take it from you. And he says to you now, will you give it? Will you simply give me permission? And I'm about to close. I'm about to close. Is there another? Will you give Christ permission? Will you say yes? Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. The Bible tells us that there is no condemnation to those who walk in the Spirit. Tonight by us simply giving the show of hands we say tonight we choose to be led by your spirit so we leave free from condemnation we thank you Lord for hearing and answering our prayers for freeing us once again in Jesus name we pray Amen